Hello and welcome to this thought for the day from the Chapels Royal in Her Majesty's Tower of London. I hope that you all remain well and safe. It is Tuesday the 26th of January. Those of you who have looked at our online Sunday service for the last Sunday, the 24th, will know that its theme was Christian unity. This got me thinking about last Wednesday the 20th of January and about tomorrow the 27th of January. There is something about all three dates which should give us cause for thought. Indeed, I might even suggest they might give us cause for repentance. Repentance, you may know, is defined as having three elements. First, sorrow for sin. Second, confession of guilt. And third, purpose of amendment. Purpose of amendment. Now, the first two of these elements, sorrow for sin and confession of guilt, carry legal overtones. They smack of the law courts. This is the aspect emphasised in the Latin word penitentia, which has given us the English words penitence, penance and repentance itself. Sorrow for sin and confession of guilt may be important elements in repentance, but they're not enough in themselves. They're backward looking, retrospective emphasising what has been, what has happened, what we have done. In the legal context, sorrow for sin and confession of guilt are normally followed by only one thing, and that is punishment. Maybe this connection with punishment puts us off the whole business of repentance. Confessing our guilt and expressing sorrow for our sin may have unpleasant consequences. If we think that way, we're perhaps likely to leave our repentance for another day. The third element in the formal definition of repentance, let us remind ourselves, is purpose of amendment, or more simply, change of heart. Change of heart is a very powerful idea. Think, for example, of God's words conveyed to his people through the prophet Ezekiel. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove from your body the heart of stone, and give you a heart of flesh, a change of heart indeed, a real life-giving transplant. Let's start with the first date that I mentioned, Sunday in the week of prayer for Christian unity. I'm glad to say that I have never personally experienced physical violence between different Christian denominations, but there are parts of this United Kingdom which have certainly experienced sectarian violence and where to this day it simmers away beneath the surface of an uneasy truce. How can Christians visit violence upon one another in the name of the one who said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. But we cannot be complacent. We must constantly check ourselves for prejudices, misconceptions and assumptions about members of other denominations. God knows that the Tower of London's history offers enough examples of bloody sectarian hatred. We must always acknowledge the errors of the past and moreover pledge ourselves not to repeat them. We must have a thorough change of heart. Last Wednesday, the 20th of January, a new President of the United States was sworn in. He spoke eloquently of the need for healing and unity in a nation which for the past four years has seen the encouragement of mistrust between different sections of society and the fermenting of division in the midst of a deadly plague which has affected all. The new president himself and the 22-year-old youth poet laureate, both of them observant Catholic Christians, urged repentance on the people of that great country, even if they never used the word itself. Tomorrow, the 27th of January, is Holocaust Memorial Day. Of course, as the name suggests, it is a day for us all to remember the horrors of the Holocaust, in which six million Jews and many other people regarded as subhuman by the Nazis perished in unimaginable cruelty. This was industrialized, meticulous, 
systematic extermination of those seen as other and therefore not worthy of treatment as human beings. But it is more than a memorial of a looking backwards. Jewish leaders have used this opportunity to denounce the treatment today of the Uyghur people in Xinjiang by the Han Chinese leaders of the Communist Party of China. There are the arbitrary arrests. There is the desecration of places of worship. There are the forced sterilizations designed to kill off an entire people. There are concentration camps, euphemistically designated re-education centers. This is a call for a change of heart on our part. The Uyghurs of Xinjiang too are our neighbors and we should love them as ourselves. Henri Tajfel was a French educated Polish psychologist who moved to Britain. In the post-war years, like other psychologists, especially Jewish psychologists, he sought to find the psychological roots of discrimination against those perceived as outsiders. In the early 1970s, he published the findings of his work on what he called minimal groups. In one experiment, he took 48 14 to 15 year old boys from the same schools and from similar social backgrounds. In other words, they started as a homogeneous group. He then allocated them randomly into two different groups on the entirely fictitious basis that they supposedly preferred the abstract art of either Paul Clay or Vasily Kandinsky. He then gave them tasks in which they could award rewards to their own group or to others. The consistent finding was that they favoured their own group, the in group, over the other group, the out group. They would even make a choice in which their own group suffered a loss, provided that the other group got the worst possible deal. This and many other psychological experiments have shown that the tendency for us to see others as belonging to an out group, which is less deserving than our own in group, is very deep rooted. It is what we call a robust finding. I'd like to make two observations here. The first is that this makes me ponder anew the meaning of original sin. The second is that, ironically perhaps, Henri Tajfel has in recent years been accused by a number of his female researchers of having made unwanted and unwelcome sexual advances to them, which rather suggests that as a man, he saw women as an outgroup with fewer rights than himself and his fellow males. Beware gods with feet of clay. But his scientific findings are, as I say, regarded as robust. So where does this leave us on this 26th of January 2021? In the present pandemic lockdown, we have plenty of time to think about who we are and who we might be. As citizens of a country with a far from glorious history of slavery and colonial exploitation, we should be especially careful never to put ourselves on a pedestal and to regard others as inferior. We should be open to sorrow for sin and confession of guilt. Most of all, in matters political, social, and religious, we should be open to repentance, to a change of heart. After all, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. 